to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide Buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Hey everybody, so we've previously covered the popular compounds analogous to IGF-1, which is insulin-like growth factor 1. Some of these include IGF-1, LR3, and IGF-1, DES, or DES, whatever you want to call it. I use these terms interchangeably in this video. Alright, let's get started. Now, I'm aware that my take on these peptides may be a bit contrarian to the popular sentiment because there are some risks that are quite concerning to me and I like to make you all aware, not to mention these in particular seem pretty overhyped in some ways, but today let's do a fact or fiction. IGF-1 is the most downstream component of the growth hormone releasing hormone pathway. GHRH is released from the hypothalamus, which triggers GH release from the pituitary, stimulating IGF-1 release from the liver. This is the essence of the hormonal pathway, but it also has stimulatory influences from ghrelin and inhibitory effects via somatostatin. And so these IGF-1 analogs are just that. Potent compounds that are analogous to IGF-1, which oftentimes maintain a prolonged half-life, thereby contributing to their efficacy, but also drawing in another layer of concern. So we're going to do a total of three prompts for this video, but I think they are the three most important and the three most all-encompassing prompts, which some peptide cowboys may and will disagree with me on, but let me lay out the facts first. So to kick things off, the first prompt is that IGF-1 LR3 and DES-13 IGF-1 or IGF-1 DES are the same thing, which duh is false, although they are similar. Let's start off by saying that IGF-1 is a 70 amino acid single chain polypeptide. IGF-1 LR3 or long arginine 3 IGF-1 is named for the amino acid replacement of glutamic acid with an arginine alongside other amino acid additions. In total, it's an 83 amino acid structure with decreased affinity for insulin-like growth factor binding proteins or IGF-BPs and strong affinity for the IGF-1 receptor. IGF-1 DES, which you'll oftentimes see labeled as DES 1-3 IGF-1, rather than elongated, like LR3, is actually a truncated form of the polypeptide IGF-1 that's missing a tripeptide moiety at its end terminus. However, similar to IGF-1 LR3, IGF-1 DES is a potent analog of IGF-1, presumably 10 times stronger, with decreased affinity for IGF-1 binding proteins. Also, there are pharmacokinetic differences differences, so here's a cute little chart I made which we can review together. So these are both analogs of IGF-1. LR3 is longer while DES or DES is shorter. LR3 has a more investigated half-life significantly longer, approximately 20 to 30 hours, while DES's half-life is understudied and unconfirmed, but proposed to fall in a range of 20 to 30 minutes, making it an overall more potent but shorter acting compound. Also of note, both of these compounds are not well studied in humans and haven't participated in clinical trials and thus are not FDA approved or really even regulated at this point. Next prompt is that potent IGF-1 analogs are risk-free, which is a BS assertion to make and one that I've seen touted online before. And I think influencers and salespeople, etc. do a huge disservice by saying these peptides that increase growth hormone in IGF-1 are risk-free and should be blended with others without consequence because not for a second do I really believe it. Yes, I imagine that the more exposure you have to a compound, as in the longer you use it and the more you use it, the greater the risk. However, I do feel that this info on IGF-1 analogs is likely translational to these GHRH analogs as well as the ghrelin agonists, as they all do increase the same end product, IGF-1. As you can tell, this is the prompt I'm most passionate about. So IGF-1 in a nutshell targets growth and inhibits anti-growth. And controlling for both of these in an otherwise healthy person signifies a big reason why these people are otherwise healthy. As cancer is essentially unregulated and invasive growth, there are different protective components that fail which allow it to take advantage of a pro-malignant physiologic ecosystem and spread. So yes, there are lots of factors involved, like environmental, genetic, amongst others, that predispose somebody to cancer. That said, I'm not convinced for a second that a healthy person 
person injecting IGF-1 is something that should be approached without a modicum of concern. Let's start off by analyzing what data, if any, has been specific to IGF-1, LR3, and DES. In mice with cancer-related muscle loss, IGF-1, LR3 limited loss of muscle mass at the expense of accelerated tumor growth. Rats with mammary adenocarcinoma, form of cancer, showed increased tumor growth with IGF-1, LR3. IGF-1, DES, in genetically predisposed mice, accelerated mammary tumor formation. And in general, when these compounds are administered to animals, predominantly rodents, who possess either an atrophic or resected organ, size reduction is usually decelerated and growth is usually accelerated, which could be useful. Think of a late-stage cancer patient with significant muscle wasting, or in an HIV patient with dysregulated fat production, maybe even an elderly person at risk for falls and fracture. Hence the FDA approval of tesamorelin for management of HIV-related lipodystrophy, characteristic of muscle wasting and fat deposition in the setting of chronic illness. In my opinion, very ill people can possibly find benefit with these compounds, but in an otherwise healthy person, supplying potent supraphysiologic dosages may not be the way to go, especially in the long term. So a good body of human research has found a positive correlation between presence of IGF-1 and different types of cancer, and these correlations have been found with breast cancer, prostate cancer, Cancer, among other chronic conditions, so much so that cancer therapeutics have attempted to target IGF-1, although the research hasn't been fully convincing and some argue it was halted prematurely. Now, there is likely a good amount of nuance to IGF-1's role in cancer development and spread. Like, I think with some types of cancers, it's a lot more predominantly positively correlated with its presence, but with others, the correlation is less apparent. So a lot of this nuance has to do with factors we're unaware of, quite possibly involved presence of different binding proteins and cell types involved, but in general the compound appears to promote cell growth and inhibit apoptosis, thereby preventing regulatory control of cell death, which incites within peptide body a sense of fear and worry, but is it just me? You can let me know in the comments below. So the third prompt for this video is that IGF-1 compounds like LR3 and DES or DES, however you want to say it, will help you put on muscle, which is a bit tricky because in my mind I would say it's 70% FOST and 30% TRUE or 60-40, some sort of proportion that favors falsity, nearing, equilibrium. But this is where a lot of people disagree with me because IGF-1 is, understandably, it's known as anabolic, which it is, and is known to stimulate diffuse proliferation of body tissues and cell types, which I don't argue with, obviously, if my biggest concern is augmented cancer risk. I do also agree that in general IGF-1 increases growth and favors environment significant for growth. I do, however, feel that most of the data in particular that paints growth hormone as a muscle grower biases populations where it would make sense, like in children deficient in growth hormone production, the elderly, and the chronically ill. Very little research, if any, highlights that in an otherwise healthy person of adult age that growth hormone augmentation would equate to increased muscle mass. So there's been research that has shown increases in lean body mass with GH administration administration, but researchers couldn't discern whether it was due to water retention versus lean muscle. Now, I acknowledge that GH is not IGF-1, although they share a hormonal pathway. So, in my opinion, it's translational, but we'll segue into IGF-1 research briefly. I do want to emphasize that I don't see the topic as black and white. I feel that if two people augment IGF-1, their responses are likely going to be different based on individual factors. Like, let's say one person regularly performs resistance training and one is sedentary. I would be tempted to say that in comparison to the person not exercising, it's the person who works out who would have enhanced features of recovery and hypertrophic action they would likely have without the compound. Maybe just enhanced recovery would facilitate in a way enhanced muscle building if you will. I would also theorize that the sedentary person results may resemble that of the elderly or chronically ill populations in the sense that the 
injections wouldn't put on stacks of muscle, but may decrease the muscle loss and atrophy that comes with not doing anything. I think we oftentimes feel as though growth hormone typically creates profound changes in body composition, which, yes, it can be the case in somebody deficient and who has been deficient for a significant period of time, but in an otherwise healthy person, this isn't really to be expected, in my opinion. And so I'm tempted to go down a rabbit hole evaluating the growth hormone trials and derail this video, but I'll just share the details of one trial on the topic that I found pretty interesting that I think you might too. So there was a pretty cool study where otherwise healthy obese adults were given growth hormone to super physiologic levels to see just how good of a treatment it would be for visceral obesity and markers of metabolic health. And the changes included minimal decreases in visceral adiposity, as well as significant increase in lean body mass and even body weight, although some of which in a known amount is thought to be due to retained water. Additional findings included that waist circumference was greater in the GH-treated population when looked at long-term after stopping therapy, and as we'd expect, an increase in insulin resistance was present with the growth hormone treatment. And to be clear, when we think about GH administration, for the most part, its actions are mediated by IGF-1, which is the reason why I found this study relevant. Not only was it done in obese, otherwise healthy adults, but this is about as close as to a quote-unquote normal population that we can get on these sorts of trials that we've gotten so far. Now, back to IGF-1 in particular. Obviously, these substances are performance-enhancing drugs, hence why they're banned substances. I can't imagine a scenario where from a muscle hypertrophy standpoint, they're even in the same universe as testosterone, for instance. However, as we touched on before, I think they craft an anabolic ecosystem, albeit not nearly as particular to muscle growth as popular culture seems to perceive it to be. But combined with the limited research in healthy people and athletes, the complexities of IGF-1 and the multiple present binding proteins and the intricate detailed signaling pathways make actually coming to a conclusion about what will definitely happen for somebody very difficult, near impossible for me, and I would imagine if that's the case, it probably is for many, if not most people out there. If I had to organize my thoughts briefly, which I admit is challenging at times, I would conclude that IGF-1 supplementation may enhance muscle growth. I don't think it causes muscle growth, but I do think that in some people who train, it's not unlikely it'll stimulate repair and muscle regeneration while preventing processes of atrophy. So I don't see it as a potent steroid-like muscle grower as many do, but rather as a compound that creates an environment of growth while inhibiting one of wasting. That's my take based off what I've read. Of course, there are limitations in our extrapolations of the data. Some of these include the limited studies on IGF-1 analogs and their complete paucity of research in humans, this makes translating the data to humans tough. However, I would encourage you to keep in mind that IGF-1 LR3's half-life is significantly longer than that of IGF-1 DES, and endogenous IGF-1 alone, which means not only is it much longer acting, but that side effects last longer too. And on top of that, although it's shorter acting, IGF-1 DES is notably more potent. So, I'm not here to tell you what to do, but to detail what we know and what we don't so that we're aware of the risks and not sailing through this obscure field of research with blinders on. That said, that's all from me today. If you did like this video and you want to see more similar content, I encourage you to like and subscribe. It's the best and pretty much only way to help me out. That said, if you're looking for a way to further support the channel, I will link the Patreon in the description below. All the videos are user requested and I post all my graphics and really cool updates in the field that I find. That said, I really appreciate the time it took you to watch this video. Thank you again, and I hope, most importantly, you have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.